Welcome to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna Da Silva, and this is episode seven. And th- today I am really excited to announce that for the first time in nearly three months of podcasting, my podcast is actually on iTunes and Google Play. It's kind of funny because the first two episodes that I recorded, uh, I think at the end of the episodes, I I asked for people to rate and review me on iTunes. And uh, <laughs> I had one of my friends message me and was like, um, so I can't find you on iTunes. Yeah, so I recorded those two um, before I actually launched the podcast and um, didn't realize I got kind of confused about the process for getting things on iTunes. However, um, it is now finally there. So if you have been listening to the podcast um, these last uh, few months and you've been enjoying it, um, it would really, really help me out if you uh, could head on over to iTunes and um, uh, rate and review. That will uh, help more people to find the podcast. Um, It affects the algorithms and things, and it really makes a big difference for me. Today, we're talking with Justina Ireland, and I believe she is the first uh, New York Times bestselling author that I've had on the podcast. Um, Not positive about that, but pretty sure. Um, And she's the author of Dread Nation, also uh, Vengeance Bound and Promise of Shadows, and the co-editor of Faya, a magazine of black speculative fiction. We will talk about her recent release, Dread Nation, um, being controversial on Twitter, the Sensitivity Reader Database, and so much more. A quick content warning, there are a couple strong words that get dropped in this conversation, so if you have small ears listening, just be aware. By the way, I have to apologize for the drop in audio quality during this um, interview. For some reason, I I somehow managed to uh, record this entire interview with Justina without realizing that my microphone was off. So the whole thing is recorded through my um, computer instead. (laughs) All right, here's my conversation with Justina. Welcome, Justina, to Females in Fantasy. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um... Okay, I am, to be honest, I am so excited to talk to you and I have so many questions and it's going to be a challenge to see if I can fit them all into <laughs> into the allotted time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but to start off, just tell us a little bit about you um, and how you got into writing. Um, so I started writing because I had a day job that was boring and kind of gave me the flexibility to write. Um, one of the things that's really hard is to make time for writing, but if you're sitting at a desk all day with not a lot to do, kind of have the time built in, especially if you are, you know, a subpar employee who does not mind like <laughs> goofing off. At work. <laughs> so yeah, so like, that's, um, that's how I started writing. Um, I started writing um, when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, and then it kind of like what is one of those things that stuck, which is kind of am- amazing to me. And, and also to like everybody who knows me because like, I'm the person with half finished crafts, like I have a whole like office closet full of like half finished embroidery, half finished scrapbooks. Um, if you like can, if you can find it in a Michael's like craft store, I probably have started it and half finished it at some point. Um, so writing was kind of like one of those other things I was trying to do. And then I just kind of like, I really enjoyed it. And it was fun and like, challenging. And um, yeah, it's like, that's how I started writing. And it's just kind of the bug bit me and I never stopped. Cool. I can, I can relate to that, the feeling of like, starting things and then not finishing them. Yeah, um, bad habit. <laughs> yeah but like, I, I don't know if it's like this for you. But for me, I just get bored very easily. So like, yeah. something will kind of lose its appeal. Um, but it's yeah, it always says a lot when a story is just like, it means so much to you, it really just like intrigues you It really grips you enough that you're going to go through the whole entire process of finishing it. Because that's writing's a lot more work than a lot of people. think. Right, right, right. Yeah. So um, give us a little like elevator pitch for your most recent release, Dread Nation. Um, So Dread Nation is about Jane McKean and she exists in an an alternate America where the zombie apocalypse starts at the Battle of Gettysburg and kind of sets in this whole um, set of of events into motion that differ from our current American history. So everything um, that you know about history um, you have to kind of throw it out starting in, like, in 1863 because everything that progresses afterwards um, is impacted by zombies. And so that's the world Jane lives in. And she's training to be an attendant um, at a, like a kind of an exclusive combat school. Um, but it's not really what she wants to do. And then hijinks ensue. 
Cool, cool. Um, I am actually so whenever I like have someone on the podcast, I always have this goal to finish the book that we're talking about beforehand. And I actually haven't finished yours. <laughs> but um, the funny thing is, is I was about maybe halfway through last night. Um, and then I sat down to read like one chapter and you know, famous last words. Um, so I've been up here. I was up very late last night. Um, it's got a really great, a really great pace. I really enjoy the fact that like every single chapter kind of ends on a question. Um, and yeah, it's, <laughs> it's genuinely hard to put down. So I, uh, I personally blame you just, you know, for the fact that I didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> I apologize. It is a really long book. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah books and they're like i've seen people like people are like how did you think about picking you know breaking out into two books and i was like not really but in hindsight that probably would have been a good idea um because then that would have been my entire publishing contract fulfilled with one book um but yeah i know it's a really <laughs> long book um and there's a lot in there and i mean yeah like i like meaty books i like books that you can reread Same. and find new things and i'm hopefully that's what i did with dread nation Cool. Yeah. So one of the things that I really enjoyed, um, when you were first releasing it on Twitter, you had like a, a kind of, a kind of funny way of advertising your book. You just like, were making a bunch of memes. Um, <laughs> it was so great. Um, and one of my favorite ones was like the, um, like the, the Black Panther meme where you had the, like, is this your book dealing with issues of racism and white supremacy in the backdrop of post civil war or something like that? Um, so, uh, so what is the the way that this book deals with uh, issues of racism and white supremacy? Um, it's kind of a loaded question, but you know, answer it however you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that happens in a lot of books is there's a lot of um, erasing of the past, a lot of erasing of um, the racism that was prevalent in the past, the racism that, that you know, we know is prevalent in the past because it still exists today. Um, there's a lot of minimizing of kind of um, the real reality of living in like the 1800s in order to kind of facilitate more of like the fun of the story, I guess. And so mm. one of the things I didn't want to do is lose sight of that. But I also still really wanted to write about old timey zombies. So uh, like one of the things I try to do is just kind of like bake it into the weft and weave of Jane's world, meaning like these are things that she deals with. Like she knows they kind of suck and it's not fair, but it's also still just the world she lives in. Um, because I think that's really one of the things that we have come to do the complacency of, of um, different issues is really kind of a hallmark of, of really humanity. Like we look at a problem and it's too big to solve. So we're kind of like, well, I guess the things are just that way. That's just the way they are. Um, and so like, I really wanted to not lose sight of like, you know, the things, the way this country was established, the way um, people have historically been exploited and continue to be exploited. Like that wouldn't change just because there's a horrible traumatic event um, and we know that wouldn't change because, for example, um, you know, Puerto Rico still has power problems and it's <laughs> it's been almost like six months after yeah. the hurricane. And we know that's a problem because, you know, during the hurricane in Houston, like people were selling, you know, necessary supplies at a ridiculous markup because they could. So like I like this, we have this uh, sort of sort of this like. I think, and I think people are, you're so, you're so cynical, but it's like, I'm just realistic. Like we have this, this idealized version of, um, that when, when things get tough, we're all going to come together. Um, and some of us, yes, will, but there are a lot of people who are going to take advantage of that, um, to further their own agendas, whatever that might be. And so that's really kind of where I went into this with story. It was like, what would this look like in the 1880s? What would this look like for this, you know, 17 year old girl? Like how would a society that has coming out of um, the horrors of shadow slavery, how would they respond to this new threat? Um, and that's kind of where the story spins out from there, from that central idea. Or what I believe the, the response would be, you know, somebody else could take this idea and it could be mm. you know, a very uplifting and, and, and amazing, um, but I just don't, I don't have that much, much faith in humanity um, in, in times where their, you know, immediate survival is the, is the issue. So. Yeah, that's true. There's an interesting, like, um, I don't know what, 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 what the word would be for that, but there's like this kind of interesting pattern where, um, in times of like intense, um, like intense, like danger and whatnot, sometimes people will, um, lean more into extremism. <laughs> right, right, um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, and like, and like if the economy takes a small dip and if, you know, like if you're having a bad day, like, like, so like, like the response, like some people do like rise to the occasion and, and those people are amazing. But I think 
far more common is the kind of the clinging to the the familiar and clinging to you know our own self preservation. And so that's kind of what you see throughout the book. I and mean, Jane is kind of thrown into this world where she's also trying to you know you know cling to her own self preservation. But that means that she has to navigate things situations that not not everybody has to navigate. Yeah. So I have a question from um, one of my patrons, um, Brennan. She asks, Justina, what was the biggest change you made to Dread Nation before publishing it? Did you shift the plot, add a character, have an epiphany about the setting? All of those. (laughs) Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah, all of those have the only thing that's really made it through the entire book intact without any kind of like um, recognizable changing is really the prologue um, where Jane is born. Um, that's really hmm. the only thing that's made it through. Um, the The ending is, was completely shifted like three or four times. Um, there are characters that um, were in the ending that never came back on screen because the ending changed. Um, so like, you know, and, and these are things that like were kind of like they're transparent to the reader. Um, but then like sometimes you'll, somebody will make it, bring up a comment about the book and you're like, oh, I actually had a scene addressing that and I had to take it out because, you know, mm-hmm. the book was like 175,000 words. Like, so like, you know, you're just like, there's, there's sacrifices you make, um, and hoping that, that you, the story still comes out, you know, how you, in, how you visualize it too. But yeah, like I have probably, um, characters changed, um, the entire, um, character arcs of, of characters changed, um, characters wow. Like we're, yeah, characters were killed off that made it to the end. Um, so like there's, there's just a little bit of everything has changed in that book. And I think that's really like, you know, we talk about revisions, but revisions aren't really revising. It's rewriting. Like you should mm-hmm. be making wholesale change changes when you're revising, not just like tinkering with words, because then you just end up with, you know, a shadow of what you already had that was, that wasn't working. It's also pretty exciting. I find that's like personally my favorite part of writing oh, yeah. is the rewriting. Yeah. yeah. You're like, yeah. You like take something that you know is like, oh, this is okay, or this isn't good at all, and then you just like find something really radical to like shift it entirely or like completely redo it, and it's just like I don't know. I find this be so satisfying. Yeah, like, no, whoa, no, definitely. Yeah. Like, drafting is like hell. It's like because you're like creating mm-hmm. like, scenes out of nothing. Like you are literally building the scaffolding of the story, but like re- revising, it's like okay, cool. I can put a little more over here, put a little more over there, and like it's like I always like like it's the difference between like baking the cake from scratch and like putting the cake together and frosting it. And like mm. the frosting a cake is always way more fun than like mixing the raw ingredients. So. Yeah. That's funny. Cause I feel like a lot of people tend to feel the opposite. I don't know. Maybe it's just people that I know, like yeah, a lot of writers. No. Yeah. They like the drafts and like, Oh, I hate editing. I'm like, I don't understand you. Yeah. <laughs> My goal in life is to get a, a, a co-writer who loves drafting so I can just uh. go back and edit. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the main character Jane. Um, so I really I have to say I'm really enjoying her a lot. I like I like her attitude. I like the fact that like she really just doesn't fit into the roles that people are trying to impose upon her. Um, and she's really like she has this she has this sense of kind of she's really bold and she'll kind of like poke Satan, you know, just to say, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like I love that about her. Um uh so i so where where was like the inspiration that came from her um and then also like are there any ways that you feel you relate to her or don't relate to her yeah so um i like jane because i like that she's just kind of unreservedly like just doesn't care and it's not that she doesn't care it's like she just doesn't care about the things that are not important um and one of the reasons like she is that way is because I needed, I didn't want to write a character that everyone was going to be like, oh, here comes this Mary Sue who's like kind of flitting her way through this very racist landscape. (laughs) You know, everyone Mm -hmm. loves her. And like, I wanted to write a character that like people like her, but maybe grudgingly, or maybe they don't like her at all. They just tolerate her. Right. So like, like I have a lot of friends who I like them, but then, and sometimes I feel like I'm just tolerating them. Right. It's like, and like, (laughs) I have coworkers that way too. It's like, I like you. Like, but by, by lunchtime, I'm like, I'm done with like being around you. Like, and just like, like, so she's, she's over the top. She's too much. Like she's like, she's just this like very bombastic character. And she kind of has to be, because if you had a very kind of milk toast, unassuming character, like, I feel like some of the trials she goes through in the book would feel overwhelming. Right. Like, mm-hmm. so you have this character who really doesn't seem to be bothered by much. And like, she's kind of like, ha ha, like, you know, racism sucks. Um, and then like, kind of like, you know, going through the story. Whereas if you follow someone like 
and then a character in the book, Catherine, like she's very serious and she like she considers these things and she's very thoughtful and she doesn't like you know rush into situations. And so I think if you're following that character, the the tone and some of the themes in the story would be too much. It would just be like very depressing. And and even it, even the story in and of itself is like it is it can be a lot for folks if you if it's especially if it's stuff that you know is is very close to home. So like mm-hmm. I wanted to have a character that was if you're going to endure this with her at least she, I want her to make the ride fun. And I am nothing like Jane. Um, I am <laughs> I am <laughs> Catherine through and through. Like you know I very much like there are rules and you follow those rules and like. You know, we, we navigate within the systems that we live and like you try to find a way to be successful within those systems of power. Um, whereas Jane's like, I don't care. Maybe I'll burn it down. Maybe I won't. It's fun. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I really <laughs> do like, I do appreciate people are like, you're just like Jane. I was like, no, I was like, I'm nothing like Jane, which is why it was such a fun character to write. That's really interesting. Like writing characters that are very different from you can be a challenge, but then also like really refreshing, you know, like trying to imagine like what it would be like in, you know, to have a different mindset. Um, yeah. So let's, let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about, um, I guess like publishing and Twitter and and whatnot. Um, (laughs) so (laughs) that's kind of a broad, so, um, well, basically this is my question for you. So (laughs) there's this wonderful um, article about you. I think it came out about a month ago, um, on the vulture. Um, and I'll include it in the show notes for listeners, but I'm going to read the headline and it goes like this. Meet Justina Ireland, YA Twitter's leading warrior, how the activist and author of Dread Nation became the most controversial figure in young adult literature, one tweet at a time. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Why are you so <laughs> controversial on Twitter? It's funny because every single time like things happen or people have very strong opinions that they feel like they need to let me know about, I'm always kind of amazed because like most of the time I'm, I'm clicking through Twitter and it's like, oh, that's kind of dumb. I'm going to like, you know, send off a tweet, which is how Twitter works, right? Like there's not a lot of like reading, considering and reacting. It's not like an academic paper. It's literally just someone's like, like knee jerk opinion. Um, And then people like kind of flood and they're like, you're so right. Or I never thought of this. Or like, you know, you're, you're destroying YA. And it's kind of amazing that like, I have become the focal point for all of that emotion when we have like super for real problems in YA, like, I mean, there are super for real problems, like, you know, only 7% of the books that were published um, last year were by black native or Latino authors. Like that's a Mm. huge problem. Um, But like, we tend to like focus in on people in YA. um, And for some reason like that, I'm a lightning rod and that's cool. Cause I mean, like, I guess like he gives people something to talk about, but at the same time, I'm like, like, I turn off the internet and I go outside and I don't think about it. And then like hmm. I log back in and I'm like, Oh, my mentions are on fire. Oh, everyone's mad. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, it's funny that people are like, when people like first started, we're like, you know, people really don't like the things you have to say. And I was like, okay, but like, they're literally, I'm not saying anything that other people haven't said. And also like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that happens on Twitter where people will read a tweet or read a, 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 thread of tweets which is better now than it used to be when we did, couldn't thread tweets and they'll take out like the one tweet and then they get mad about that one tweet instead of looking at the thing in context which again mm. that's their right but i'm i don't have to engage with that i think that's what makes people mad is that like i won't i won't not gonna sit there and argue and like mea culpa on the internet because it's the internet um like i have friends that i know through the internet i have, have friends that i know through facebook i have friends that i know in real life um, and like the people who know me, know me, like the people who have a, like a, have built up some sort of like ideology about me, like that's completely separate from who I really am. And that's, if that gives them, if that helps them get out of bed every day, then I've still served a purpose, right? Like whether you like hate me or you think I'm amazing, like it's still like, you're still thinking about me, which means I still kind of win, which is, <laughs> which is kind of like the, uh, you know, the every controversial f- figure ever kind of perspective. Right. Like, yeah. Like it's mm. one of those things that like when, when, uh, when that article came out, I started laughing because I literally like talked with that reporter for probably about like four hours about like, really? yeah, about like critique and YA and about like, like legitimizing YA instead of making it this other category. Cause it's always kind of mm. slandered and like shat upon and it's like, Oh, yep. you know, it's all just romance and girls and their feelings. And like, no, like YA seems saying some serious things. There are like, you know, the depth and breadth of YA will rival any other, uh, 
like part of publishing. Like you could just stop publishing. Absolutely. Yeah, you could put, stop publishing every other book, um, every other category of books, and YA would still have something like very important and valuable to say. But instead, we, we get reduced to like you know this, these caricatures of like you know oh mean YA Twitter and like those kinds of things. And I'm like you know like that's that's because you are ascribing a value to what YA has to say because of the intended audience. And if you're ascribing a value to what, what happens there, or you're ascribing some sort of artificial limits upon what those stories impose, like that's just more about you than anybody else. So yeah, like I don't sweat, I don't sweat Twitter. People always want to come up to me like, Oh, so Twitter. And I'm like, yeah, dude, like people are messy everywhere. Like people are messy at a party. People are messy on Twitter and Twitter's like a nonstop party where no one can go home because no one knows how to log off. So yeah. <laughs> so I try not to let yeah. me, I just like, keep, I just keep writing my stories and if they're good, they'll get published. And if not, I'll fade into obscurity. You know, that seems like a really healthy mindset to have. I, I think a lot of people online and I, I include myself in this a little bit, like we get like way too, way too in depth and way too like serious about it when it's really just, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle for us to communicate and for us to meet people and network and stuff like that and to learn things um, and to listen. But then at the end of the day, like, it's still like, <laughs> it's not like, it's not the thing, you know, like the thing is like writing the books and being in person and stuff like that. Like it's, yeah. Um, I mean, like it's kind of, a, yeah. it's kind of an incredible that like, you know, there's this whole industry of people who don't really use Twitter. Like there are a lot of publishing people who might have a Twitter, but they're not on Twitter, right? So like they're making decisions about books that are completely uninf- uninfluenced by what happens on Twitter or what happens mm. on Goodreads or what happens on Amazon or any of these places, right? Because they're looking at things from a business perspective, like how can they monetize things? So I think like this idea that Twitter is YA publishing is really short-sighted because unless you're actually in the quote room where it happens, you don't know what those conversations look like. Like, like, I don't know what those conversations look like. I know what those conversations look like in regards to my work, but I don't know what those conversations look like in regards to other people's work, right? And like the same way I don't know like what was going through an author's mind when they crafted a story. I can only go by what's on the page. Like Twitter is, is not the entirety of publishing. It's not the entirety of decisions that are being made. There's a lot of stuff that's happening in the background and folks will make these very, you know, very like declarative statements of like, why Twitter or why publishing doesn't do this? And I'm like, okay, but you don't know any of YA publishing or you don't know all of YA publishing. You know, is it, are you talking about your corner YA publishing? Because the people who are actually in publishing, like the, like the editors and stuff, what I found is that they don't talk about the, you know, the bullshit on Twitter because it's not the, that's not the forum for it, right? They have board mm-hmm. meetings and they have, you know, those kinds of things to, to, where, they, where they hash those things out, not like the court of public opinion. So yeah, so it's like you have to like kind of put it in perspective. I know a lot of like Twitter, it's like one of those things like a lot of like authors are like, I can't, Twitter's too much. I can't do it. It's like, it's like, dude, it's, I mean, like, that's cool. Like there's Instagram, like Instagram is literally yeah. for like, I don't want to get in a fight with people all the time. I'm just going to post pictures of my dog. Right. And, oh, <laughs> Instagram well, is so much nicer yeah, in that way. Right? And it's like, also here's my book that comes out next week. Right. And so there are a lot of mm-hmm. authors. Like you're going to see uh, more and more authors refuse to engage on on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like Becky Albertalli just went through like uh, like a shit storm because people were like were like pulling out excerpts of her book out of context and mm-hmm. and they were mad and they were like you know like basically sliding into her DMs and sending her ra- harassing messages and finally she was like, mm-hmm. I'm not doing this. So what's going to end up happening is like the access that people enjoy with authors and like publishing professionals now that's going to is if, if Twitter continues the way it is, that'll be less and less of that. And that's, Mm. I mean, maybe that's, maybe Twitter's run its course. Maybe we've gotten what we can out of Twitter. I still like Twitter. I still like going and like reading the news and like, I can get all of the news in like 10 minutes. Um, And I mean, like, and it's, it's very slanted because I only see like certain things to the people I follow. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, like, I don't know. Twitter's Twitter. Yeah. I think, I think that's good for like, even for me to hear, because it's, it's definitely my favorite place to be for social media, but it, it can't, it can be everything. And, um, it can be unhealthy depending on like how you're engaging with it, you know? Um, and there's a lot of like, it's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity there that, uh, I think will probably continue to drive some people away. Yeah. I mean, Um, I think, I think for some people like that is the entirety of their social interaction which I think it can be super dangerous if like, and like, unless like there's something that's, you know, keeping you from um, interacting with people in other ways, because like things on Twitter come across with a tone, depending on how you read them. Right. Like you can read two, three people can read the same tweet and it can get three different, you know, um, 
meanings out of it. But if mm-hmm. you're in person and you have somebody says something and you ask exploratory questions, it can really cut down a lot of those misunderstandings. So I think like, I think while Twitter is great at like boosting voices, especially marginalized voices that have been ignored, I think the real work still has to, has to happen like in a face to face manner. Well, that's a kind of a good segue to my next question. Speaking of boosting marginalized voices, um, so you were previously involved in um, this popular uh, Google spreadsheet of sensitivity readers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what was your like? What was your involvement behind that? Um, and then, like, uh, I guess actually, maybe we should um, maybe for the init- for the uninitiated, like, briefly describe what a, a sensitivity reader is. Um, and then what led you to like, uh, I guess you created it or maintained it or I'm not sure. Actually yeah, what yeah. You're doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> I did both until recently. Um, yeah. So, yeah. um, sensitivity reader is something that's always pr- pretty much existed in the, um, the industry that people call it by different names. They call it like vetting, which I don't like because it sounds like there's a seal of approval at the end. Um, mm-hmm. they call yeah. it, um, authentic- authenticity reads or something like that, whatever you want to call it. But it's basically, I wrote a book outside of my cultural experience, or I have secondary characters that exist within a culture with outside of mine. And I want to make sure that I didn't write my biases or societal biases into the, the, the manuscript. So I'm going to have somebody read for just because things like word choice can really throw. I mean, mm-hmm. like, like when I, whenever I read a book and like, like a black person is described like by like coffee, like anytime you see a black person described as like a cup of coffee, I'm like, ah, oh. it's like, you're just, I mean, it's not, it's not like, oh my God, the most racist thing ever, but it's just kind of wincy and like, kind of like cringe worthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were a lot of folks that there were a lot of, this is during the whole We Need Diverse books. Um, when it first started spinning up in 2014, um, a lot of white authors heard that call and they, they were like, I'm going to write about a marginalized group, which I mean, you do you. Um, but then like what was happening was a lot of marginalized people were getting like asked by their white friends to read their manuscripts and vet them for them. Um, mm. or to like, you know, either give it a seal of approval or tell them what they got wrong or tell them how authentic it was and that kind of stuff. And they were doing a lot of this labor for free. And so I was like, look, like we need to have, like set a standard so people get paid for this work because if somebody is going to cash in on your, your identity, you should at least be able to like get a little payment somewhere, right? Like, um, yeah. like you shouldn't be helping them for free because apparently it was pretty rampant. Um, all the all the authors of color I had spoken to were like, yeah, like this is exhausting. Like I can't read another like coming to America tale by like like a one of my friends because it, it's also kind of like when you're reading for friends, it's it's uncomfortable because like you're expected to give feedback, but then like nobody really wants to hear like, Hey, your book is super racist, right? Like that's not yeah. what people are going to like, like ask for. Um, so like I, like I talked to um, some other authors of color and I was like, well, do you think it'd be useful to like, like lay out this like third party, like kind of like here, these are people who will be willing to read for you for pay, like stop bugging your friends. And a lot of people were like, yeah, I'd love that. And so I started the, the database. Um, it was featured in a couple different uh, media places and it kept growing. And finally, it got to the point where um, there were over 200 people on the, the database. People were coming to me asking for recommendations. People were coming to me asking me to update records because I originally had it locked down because I didn't want people to go in there and, and kind of be dicks about it and like just start changing shit. Um, and mm. then like at, 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 after two years... Um, we got to the point where I was like, I think most publishers and most editors have a good list, right? Because like I, I like I have gone to events and, and spoken with a publishing audience and said, you know, my my recommendation was like, here, this should be where you get started, but you should have your own in house list, right? Just like you do for a copy editors, like you don't just like send out a, a tweet on Twitter like I need a copy editor for this book. It's like you have a set, set list of copy editors who are going to uh, who have been you know like kind of used before, you have a good relationship with. You know, that's what you should have for sensitivity readers. So at that point, um, or earlier this year, like it, just, it was just too much. It was too much for me to maintain. Um, there were people who were like, I didn't get paid. And there were people who were like, I paid and I never got anything back. And I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm not the better business girl. Like I started this as sort of a grassroots thing for folks to get paid. There are some people who were like, yeah, this is great. It like helps me pay my rent, which is awesome. You know, they, yeah. they got something, yeah, they got something significant out of it. But at some point, like at some point, like you just can't do it anymore, right? It just becomes too much. And it became too much. And so 
Um, I wasn't interested in trying to monetize it, which I know is a thing somebody will probably do at some point um, for mm. myself. I just, I just, that's not like I have a day job. I don't, I don't need the extra work. Um, and so like, I just kind of was like, look, here it is. It's open. It's there. Um, if people want to use it, they know where it is. The link has been in the, the community long enough. You can, you can Google it. It comes up. It's the first thing that comes up. Um, and so I think now it's out there. Um, I, last I talked, um, um, the people who do the writing, the other courses, uh, Nisi Shaw, um, and Tempest, um, we're going to like, try to like, kind of start their own private list for their, for people who go through their, their course, because they've already, well, that's awesome. Yeah. And so I think that's a, that's a cool thing to do as a cool benefit. And then also if you're a sensitivity reader, you're working with somebody who apparently, who, you know, should have already had some, it's coming from a, a position of like education instead of a position of like, I just felt like writing a black character, you know, like, <laughs> which is like mm-hmm. sometimes what you get and it's awful. Um, yeah. So like, that was kind of like, like, I was like, that's a cool transition. Like, let them take it over and they can, um, they can. So yeah, so I like, it'll exist. I think people have gone off and started their own um, and that, and they'll still, you know, but there's also now a standard and expectation that if a publisher asks somebody to read a manuscript for um, any kind of authenticity or cultural background, they're going to get paid. Right. And so that was really what I wanted to do was kind of start this, like this business standard that we don't, ask people to read our shit for free um because like that's not cool yeah 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 definitely okay we're almost out of time so i want to quickly ask you about one more thing um and that is that you are the uh co-editor of the faya magazine yeah um yeah so tell us what that is um and, yeah just tell us a little bit about that yeah, so faya lit mag is a magazine that was um, started by uh, a collective of um black science fiction and fantasy writers um, because after Fireside Fiction Magazine came out with a, comes out with an annual report of how many um, science adult on the adult science fiction and fantasy side, how many of the small um, small markets, uh, uh, short fiction markets rather, um, publish authors of color or publish black authors specifically. Um, and what we see is like you know it's like a high rate of um, certain authors, but for black authors they're always left behind. Um, they don't and the, and when black authors are published, it tends to be the same four or five names over and over. So you know mm-hmm. there's always this pushback um, by you know certain magazines that like well you know we would publish black authors, but we have colorblind submissions and their stories just aren't good or they're not writing the stories or whatever the excuse mm-hmm. of the day is. And so we were like well, fuck that. Let's show everybody. And so we started a little bit <laughs> because that's what you do um, when you like live in a world where no one's going to appreciate you. Like, so we started our own, right? Because we wanted to start kind of like a, a community and more of like a kind of a, a place for, for black authors to kind of get their feet under themselves and see like, yes, your words have merit. Yes, your words are good. Like, you know, just because you're, if you're getting rejections, maybe it's not the quality of your writing. Maybe it's you know, because they don't connect with your voice. And maybe that says something more about those people instead of the, what you're actually crafting. So we're in our second year. Um, I have, I executive edit with my, with Troy Wiggins, who was my co-editor, who was my co-executive editor. Um, and we, the magazine is just amazing. Like the, the, the Twitter, that's probably the one Twitter like feed I would say you should go follow because it's a very, it's a very <laughs> positive Twitter feed. Um, mm. And like they're like our social media team is always um, doing like, you know, we do write-ins during NaNoWriMo, um, during Poetry Month, There's we do articles um, and we do a quarterly um, electronic uh, magazine, like four, four times, quarterly is four times a year, but four times a year we do like electronic edition um, and we do themes. We're talking, we have to talk, we're going to talk about for year three, we might open it up to more general submissions um, just because I think not everybody connects with every, every theme. Um, and yeah, it's like, I'm really proud. Like our cover art is amazing. Um, it really is. Yeah, I think so. that's our, our, um, our artistic director, Latrice. Um, and like, it's just, yeah, it's like, it's just amazing. I don't know. Like, it's just, it's one of those things that's like you set out to like create something and you're like, oh, well, I guess this will be okay. And then like the end result is just like, this is you know, succeeded and surpassed like my wildest expectations. The stories we get are just phenomenal. Um, and there are so many talented black authors out there who are just trying to get their stories told, who are not necessarily finding homes in other venues. And like, hopefully like our, our magazine gives them that, that leg up, that foot, that confidence builder so they can keep uh, knocking on the door. 
Awesome. Well, that is a, a perfect uh, note to end this conversation on. Um, before we go, uh, could you let people know where they could find you um, if they want to keep up with your work and things like that? So my website is justinaireland.com, J-U-S-T-I-N-A-I-R-E-L-A-N-D. Um, I'm on Twitter as Justina Ireland. Uh, now and then you can come and yell at me. <laughs> you can come yell at me with everybody else. Um and then you can also find me on Instagram as Justina I. And that's mostly pictures of my cat because I have a cat. And my dog. Oh, I have my. a dog. Yeah, yeah. So that's more fun. And, and uh, I mean, obviously, you can get Dread Nation wherever fine books are sold. All right. Well, thank you again so much for being on the podcast and you have a wonderful Saturday. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. That was my conversation with Justina Ireland. A quick note about the sensitivity reader database that we were talking about. So I recorded that interview with Justina on May 12th. And as I am recording this outro as of May 17th, uh, that sensitivity reader database has been locked down. Um, Apparently, someone was using it to send harassing emails to people of color that were on that um, spreadsheet. So the latest news I believe currently is that there's going to be a new one. It's going to be private this time and it will be available to alumni of the uh, writing the other course. Um, I'm going to, I will include a link to that course um, in the show notes. It's something that I'm actually intending to take at some point. I think it's really important for writers um, who, who want to write about ca- uh, characters with different experiences and um, identities from themselves. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I think that makes sense to have that uh, um, a little bit more protected. Um, so uh, Kay Tempest Bradford will be uh, giving updates about that on Twitter. Um, her handle is at Tiny Tempest. One of the things that um, Justina and I also didn't have time to talk about in this uh, conversation was that she recently wrote a Star Wars novel. Um, so I had I s- recorded a separate conversation with her, um, and that's available uh, to my patrons at uh, patreon.com slash females and fantasy. So if you want to hear more about what the process was like uh, writing for a major franchise like Star Wars, uh, you can head on over to that and get lots of extra conversations that I have um, with all of my podcast guests. I want to thank Mireille Gash for the logo illustration and all of my Twitter friends who have been faithfully retweeting and spreading the word. I really appreciate it. You can keep in touch on Twitter at females in, that's the letter in, fantasy, or with me personally at uh, Brianna underscore Da Silva. Or you can drop me a line at femalesinfantasy at gmail.com. The next Females in Fantasy Twitter chat is coming up. It's going to be on May 26th. Uh, that's a Saturday at um, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be talking about female revolutionaries. So bring all your opinions about Katniss and Triss and Mulan and whoever else. Um, so I hope you'll join us there. Uh, next time on the podcast, we're going to be having my friend Joyce Ching. Uh, she is a Singaporean speculative fiction writer, um, also really awesome and sweet, and she has a penchant for wolves. <laughs> so get ready for that. Meanwhile, this has been the Females in Fantasy podcast. I am Brianna Da Silva. Thanks for listening. <laughs>